Uh, I'm going to talk about a novel that was published 39 years ago, in 1969. Jose Angliongto's The Sultanate is the first novel on the Philippine Chinese, written by a Chinese Filipino, and intended for the so-called overseas Chinese, or in Mandarin, Hua Chao. But it is by far the least read and appreciated among the six novels published in and outside the Philippines over the four, past four decades. Why was such a novel addressed to such an audience about such a topic, written at such a time and by such an author? And what accounts for the novel's relative obscurity? The main events in the Sultanate unfold in the immediate aftermath of World War II. Recently widowed 50-year-old Generoso Di Anko, a successful businessman, leader of the Chinese community in Davao in southern Philippines, and son of a Chinese trader who married a native princess, is assassinated at the instigation of his business rivals. Rolando, the youngest son, finds himself without direction in life. Mariano, the, the eldest, concentrates on making money, eventually becoming a tycoon. Grieving is more protracted for the middle son, Ricardo, whose father's death triggers an identity crisis. Frustrated by the inability of his relatives and the factionalized Chinese community to bring his father's killers to justice, Rick embarks on a study trip to China. He writes home with his observations of a China in political and social crisis and returns to the Philippines determined to build, quote, his own sultanate out of sweat and brawn and in the hearts of the people, unquote. Convinced that the communist takeover of China means that the security of the Philippines is at stake and setting out to prove himself a good citizen, Rick becomes a counter espionage agent for the Philippine state and spends 10 years working undercover within the Chinese community to identify the, quote, red infiltrators, unquote. He also proposes easier access to citizenship and assimilation for the Chinese. The semi-autobiographical The Sultanate addresses the nationalist problematic of community and belonging through its depiction of protagonist Ricardo's life and career as a good citizen. If the concept of citizenship is a way of specifying the relationship between the state and individual, as well as a way of formulating the conditions of membership in a community, then what does the Sultanate tell us about the terms and limits of Chinese membership in the Philippine national community? Variously identified with capitalism, communism, and cultural chauvinism, the Chinese were viewed as economically dominant, politically disloyal, and culturally different. They were the specific targets of economic nationalism, of periodic raids by the Philippine military, of public clamor for mass deportation, and calls for the assimilation or integration of this minority community. Given this construction of the Chinese as aliens, acquiring citizenship was a protracted, difficult, and extremely expensive process. The Philippines differs from other Southeast Asian countries in the role played by judicial interpretation and American legacy in restricting Chinese access to citizenship alongside the application since 1935 of the principle of eus sanguinis, or right by blood, in determining a citizenship by blood in determining Chinese membership in the Philippine national community. Ang Leonto's novel is noteworthy for its choice of the mixed blood or mestizo Chinese as patri patriarch. No doubt the choice of a mestizo protagonist over a quote unquote pure Chinese may have been dictated by hopes of attracting a wider readership and facilitating readerly identification with the main characters among the Filipino reading public. Moreover, intermarriage is commonly taken in sociological literature as a key index of incorporation, if not assimilation. In this sense, the mestizo physically embodies the fusion or amalgamation of ethnic or racial groups, thus making hybridity a genetic fact rather than a mere metaphor of cultural exchange and border crossing. But if the fusion of ethnic groups through interbreeding is a universally human condition, if the so-called Filipino race is generically mestizo, and many of the country's national heroes and leaders are in fact not Chinese mestizos, then what accounts for, according to Ang Leongto, the deglamorization of Chinese mestizos, the fact that they were treated as second-class citizens in the post-war period? The mestizos debased status has to do with historical shifts in valuation of blood, territorial nativity, domicile, and conversion in defining the terms of Chinese membership in the Spanish and American colonial states and the Philippine national community. Unlike the Dutch or the British or the French in Southeast Asia, 
The Spanish colonial state in the Philippines created a separate legal category for people of mixed blood ancestry. But because few Spaniards settled in the colonies and there were no African slaves and their descendants, Philippine colonial society was not characterized by the highly ramified social distinctions based on fine gradations of skin color. And the term mestizo, in fact, mainly referred to the far more numerous population of mixed native and Chinese ancestry. Conversion to Catholicism, however, allowed the Chinese to establish permanent residence, move around within the bounds of the uh, colonial territory, and marry native women. But the creation of the Chinese mestizo as a legal category also meant that there would be no native or Philippine-born Chinese, whereas Chinese mestizos were almost certainly native-born. The mestizos' blood link to the Chinese allowed mestizos, who were thought to inherit their father's capital and financial aptitude, to engage in trade, while their blood ties to their native mothers and their territorial nativity in the Philippines meant that they were raised as Catholics and, unlike their fathers, could be born off the land and thus be entitled to acquire land, unlike their fathers. By the mid-19th century, in line with the economic transformation of the colony, conversion was no longer the sine qua non of permanent settlement, and in the late 1880s, the mestizo category was abolished. Mestizos were, along with the native elites, some of the most hispanized among the Philippine population, and because they found their room for advancement and recognition blocked by Spanish racial prejudice, also among the most politically articulate. The nationalism of these so-called ilustrados, or enlightened ones, was informed by uh, 19th century racial and wave migration theories, which often included the Chinese mestizoness of these elites and excluded the mountain tribes and the Muslims. Nevertheless, the 1899 Malolos Constitution of the Philippine Revolutionary Government, reacting against the Spanish preoccupation with racial hierarchies, made the principle of use solely or citizenship by place of birth, as well as residency, the basis for extending citizenship to foreigners, including Chinese. Moreover, the presence of a full-blooded Chinese in the Revolutionary Army attests to an expanded definition of political membership based on the common endeavor of revolutionary activism. Americans, in their turn, applied the Chinese exclusion law to the Philippines in an effort to prevent Chinese labor immigration and to, quote, preserve the islands for the natives thereof, unquote. They ensured that the Chinese merchant became an identity that was to be inherited across generations. Mestizos enjoyed some flexibility since they could elect Filipino citizenship and opt out of the mercantile uh, occupations of their fathers upon reaching maturity. And even though the Chinese exclusion law re remained in effect until 1940, judicial interpretation selectively applied use solely to extend citizenship to the Chinese. The first drastic change came when the Philippine Commonwealth upheld Chinese exclusion and made use so sanguinis the basis of Philippine citizenship in 1935. While mestizos used to be exempt from the restrictions imposed on their Chinese fathers, the principle of bloodline was increasingly used against them as their Chineseness came to overshadow their Filipino connections. By the post-war period, on the other one, on one hand, the Philippine laws aimed at preventing Chinese from practicing professions and owning land further drove the Chinese deeper into their economic mercantile niche. Cold War geopolitical and strategic imperatives assumed institutional form in the Treaty of Amity between the Philippines and the Republic of China within the context of America's, quote, free Asia, unquote, containment policy. This 1947 treaty gave Taiwan's Kuomintang Party and the Chinese Embassy in Manila the power of politically and culturally policing the Chinese community. This policing took place alongside the Republican government's efforts over many decades to um, integrate or to nationalize uh, the, not just the Taiwanese, but by extension, the overseas Chinese. Uh, before the war, this in fact competed with an alternative you know, movement uh, led by the communists, which had attempted to politicize the Chinese in Southeast Asia. The post-independence period thus saw mestizo identity becoming far more circumscribed by the e either or logic that distinguished Filipino from Chinese. Mestizoness was becoming selectively desinicized and resinicized as some mestizos came to be seen and lumped as Chinese, while the term mestizo itself in popular usage was stripped of its sociological and historical reference to Chinese and was increasingly ascribed to Filipinos of mainly white ancestry 
whose hybridity indexed the hegemonic power and prestige of white America slash Europe. In the Sultanate, mestizoness is thematically rendered in terms borrowed from sociological disc discourse as a form of in-betweenness, an identity crisis. Middle son Ricardo feels himself caught in the middle of two cultures. Rick argues that the true meaning of citizenship does not lie in the standard definition of citizenship by blood or by accident of birth, nor is it a question of attaining the right social status as his uh, brother Mariano had opted to do. The true measure, according to him, is the heart, mental attitude, and action of a good citizen. Rick sees his service to the Philippine state as a means of proving himself a good Filipino. This entails working <coughs> to advance the anti-communist agenda of the state. As an insider, Rick utilizes his linguistic skills and kinship and social connections to the Chinese to ferret out subversives. He simultaneously advocates the integration of the good Chinese, quote unquote, into the Philippine mainstream. But the demands of secrecy ensure that Rick's motives and actions are understood and appreciated only by himself or at best by a few other people. Other than Rick himself, the main source of validation for Rick's actions is in fact the reader of the novel, who is privy to Rick's secrets and innermost thoughts and can attest, therefore, to the purity of Rick's motives. In other words, the novel's main function is to verify Rick's motives and actions as, quote, a good citizen, unquote. The fact that it goes through such lengths to do so reminds us of the structural ambivalence at the heart of citizenship. Citizenship is a representational practice, something that is embodied and enacted by persons in their encounters with the state and in their exchanges with other persons. Changing citizenship is modeled loosely on religious conversion in that civic conversion entails the adoption of a new political identity, a renouncing of allegiance to one political entity in favor of the transfer of loyalty to another. Unlike religious conversion, however, where the final authority for determining sincerity rests on an omniscient God, in a secular context, the authority rests primarily on an all too fallible state and its representatives. Another difference is that while the religious convert is conceived as a porous self, susceptible to as well as receptive of outside, for example, divine influences, the secular era valorizes a fortress-like individual whose thoughts and motivations, however, at least since Darwin and Freud, are not so readily fathomable. Sincerity is externally manifested through the convert's words and deeds, but the fact that no one, not an all too fallible state, nor even perhaps the convert, has unmediated access to the convert's heart, quote unquote, means that words and deeds cannot always be taken as direct expression of a political change of heart. The structural indeterminacy of conversion means that conversion itself resists the closure offered by a definitive reading. It is always incomplete because the convert's faith or loyalty must be affirmed and tested again and again. Not even religious conversion is completely free of this indeterminacy. Spaniards energetically converted the Chinese to Catholicism while in the same breath questioning the sincerity of the converts. Similarly, charges of citizenship by convenience has been, have been leveled at the Chinese when they apply for citizenship, even as they are enjoined to assimilate or integrate themselves into the Filipino national community. In religious conversion, sincerity, while reflective of the inner state of the convert, is not necessarily linked to the question of a convert's virtue, since it only requires that the person desire to be virtuous. But in political conversion, the question of authenticity is conflated with the question of virtue, since civic conversion hinges on a person's prior qualifications for being granted citizenship. Therefore, from the point of view of the state, accepting a quote-unquote good Chinese as Filipino simultaneously entails justifying the rejection of bad Chinese. But who has the authority to decide? In the Philippines, the authority accorded to judicial interpretation puts the power of decision in the hands of individual judges. Given that decision is made on a case-to-case -case basis, judges routinely assess individual character and qualification on the basis of documentary evidence couched in narrative form of an individual's life and career. And because intentions and allegiance are not self-evident even from words and deeds, Judges find themselves looking, quote unquote, beyond the external appearance and acts of the individual to discover the, quote unquote, true meaning and proof of integration. <laughs>
Such attempts to construct, imagine, and police the intentions of the Chinese ends up producing a Manichaean distinction between good and bad Chinese that simultaneously humanizes individual Chinese while also reinforcing negative images of the Chinese as a group, thereby aggravating the public demonization of the Chinese. This ambivalence cannot be explained away by citing empirical instances of Chinese sincerity or insincerity, or by saying that there are always good or bad Chinese, since it is an intrinsic feature of the discourse of belonging. The irony of Rick's identification with the anti-communist state is that the ideological foundation of that state was increasingly challenged by the radicalization of the Philippine youth and Philippine politics in general in the late 1960s. The authority that decides which Chinese is good or bad is now itself judged and found wanting. Fittingly enough, and given the critique of state legitimacy by radical social forces, the Sultanate resolves the danger of Rick's misplaced loyalty by having Rick withdraw from politics altogether and retire to his enchanted island. Succeeding events would also overtake the novel. Less than five years after the Sultanate was published, President Ferdinand Marcos implemented the mass naturalization of the Chinese, authorizing this law in conjunction with the normalization of diplomatic relations between the Philippines and the F People's Republic of China. Marcos was not merely following American lead in seeking entente with China. His new Asia policy, formulated in light of the decline of Philippine trade with the US, sought to strengthen Philippine trade links with Asian and socialist countries. In addition, the Marcos government needed to secure oil supplies from China to deal with the 1973 oil crisis and to undermine the communist movement in the Philippines by asking China to adopt a hands-off policy toward Philippine internal affairs. Mass naturalization entailed a shift in the discourse of nationalism away from monoculturalist and melting pot claims of assimilation routinely associated with ideas of cultural absorption and amalgamation toward a political definition of national belonging, which held that ethnic or minority groups could be integrated, quote unquote, into Philippine society while preserving their cultural identities. This pluralist stance on national identity is bound up with the shifting strategies over the last three decades of the Philippine state. Pursuing a policy of attracting capital and technical flows, especially from the East Asian region, the state has resorted to commodifying citizenship by granting permanent residency to investors or moneyed foreigners while seeking to re-territorialize the growing number of Filipino outmigrants and their descendants through dual citizenship. Meanwhile, Marcos's policies of Filipinizing the Chinese had effectively turned younger generations of Chinese into non-Chinese speaking but culturally Chinese mestizos whose mestizo uh, was both a source of parental anxiety about the loss of Chinese culture and by the 1990s, a cultural asset in its ability to claim Filipinoness while mediating the East Asian capital and cultural flows. Safely Filipinized, Chineseness could be reintroduced as a tourist attraction to generate state revenues as the redevelopment of Chinatown into a showcase of the Chinese mestizo hybridity of Filipino culture in general under martial law attests. This commodification of Chineseness, however, has also made the Chinese vulnerable to extortion and kidnapping. Reading the Sultanate nearly 40 years later, we can see how the novel's call for easing restrictions on citizenship has borne fruit since the 1970s. Its concern with the ritual expression of patriotism through asserted political loyalty remains a basic assumption of the now dominant integration discourse, but the irony is that it is not only Chineseness, but Filipinoness itself, that has undergone red redefinition in light of the Filipino diaspora and the ritual expressions of patriotism have been transformed as well. Contributions to the quote unquote economic, social and cultural development of our country can now be done without being physically based or rooted in the Philippines. Demonstrating one's love of country no longer precludes taking up citizenship and residency elsewhere. Affinity to the customs, traditions, and ideals of the Filipino people has been defined so flexibly that it can encompass non-Filipino nationals who do not speak any Philippine languages or send their children to Filipino schools, nor even mingle socially with Filipinos. The Sultanate's impact and social relevance as a novel have been vitiated by the fact that its ideological anti-communism has been undercut by changes in Philippine foreign and domestic policy as well as region-wide developments in East Asia, 
and the globalization of discourses of integration and multiculturalism. The datedness of the Sultanate, in effect, underscores how quickly some of the ideas in the novel at achieved orthodoxy, while others became obsolete within just a few years after the book's publication. Thank you.